This is the sermon for April 24th, 2022, and I'll read first from Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. Pay close attention now. I'm creating new heavens and a new earth. All the earlier troubles, chaos, and pain are things of the past to be forgotten. Look ahead with joy. Anticipate what I'm creating. I'll create Jerusalem as sheer joy. I'll create my people as pure delight. I'll take joy in Jerusalem, take delight in my people. No more sounds of weeping in the city, no cries of anguish, no more babies dying in the cradle or old people who don't enjoy a full lifetime. 100th birthdays will be considered normal. Anything less will seem like a cheat. They'll build houses and move in. They'll plant fields and eat what they grow. No more building a house that some outsider takes over. No more planting fields that some enemy confiscates. For my people will be as long lived as trees. My chosen ones will have satisfaction in their work. They won't work and have nothing come of it. For they themselves are plantings blessed by God, with their children and grandchildren likewise God blessed. Before they call out, I'll answer. Before they finish speaking, I'll have heard. Wolf and lamb will graze the same meadow, Lion and ox eat straw from the same trough, but snakes, they'll get a diet of dirt. Neither animal nor human will hurt or kill anywhere on my holy mountain, says God. And then from Acts chapter 10, 34 and 35. Peter fairly exploded with his good news it's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready, the door is open. Well, today I wanted to speak about curiosity and laughter as many churches celebrate Holy Humor Sunday, an appropriate way to celebrate the week following Easter. Easter is good news. We hardly hear it anymore, but it is really good news. New life, new strength, new wholeness, becoming more in line with the love and grace of God. Grace just by itself is worthy of laughter and relief. There are many other sources of laughter and relief, but I just want to focus on what God is doing today. We tend to imagine ourselves as the prodigal who has returned home from the pigsties in a foreign land. So hungry we wanted to eat the pig's bean pods, maybe having come out of being in a slave, being a slave in a land where we don't even speak the language. We return home practicing a speech that we really screwed up, were horrible, and would father accept me as a servant on the home place? Maybe I can earn my way back. Instead, the father sees me from a distance and runs to me, embracing me, celebrating. I am fully accepted as a beloved child with a full part in the home farm. New robe, new ring on my finger, and a party to celebrate. Do we laugh or cry or both? Well, in reality, church folks are more like the older brother uh, who stands apart in judgment at the father's compassionate, loving response to the prodigal. The older brother harumphs, this son of yours screwed up and will have to earn his way back, if that. Then the father comes out to the older son working in the field. <laughs> The father comes out of the party and says, All that I have is yours. Always has been. Always will be. Come and join the celebration. Again, do we laugh or cry 
or both? <laughs> when it comes to God's love, forgiveness, and mercy, we are astonished and we tell about it. Think about when you've had great news, the best news, and you're overflowing with happiness. You can't help but want to tell others. When you thought you lost everything and now you have been restored to what you thought was gone. Psalm 126 verse 1 says, We were like those who dream. When lost, when utterly lost, we wept bitterly. This is the reality of human life and of suffering. And then, beyond our imagining, Christ is risen. New life is there for us to celebrate. Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Israel says, we were like those who dream. Do Christians have that same sense of homecoming? The community is what God has given us to make a difference. And when we doubt and struggle even to believe, to have faith, um, every day can be, for us, is filled with wonder. Sure, we go through bad times, for sure, and maybe we barely survive. Sometimes healing comes through death, um, the ultimate reversal. Um, we pray for healing, but there are no guarantees ever, ever except the guarantee that ultimately God holds us as a loving mother. We are held and loved tenderly. So as I was saying, community for me is what God gives me to make a difference, and I think to all of us to make a difference. It isn't enough to have God um, spiritual. I want a God with skin on, like the little kid says when he's scared at night. And the mother says, you can always pray. And the little boy says, no, I, I need a God with skin on. <laughs> he wanted to be comforted by his mother. So the community is what God gives us to make a difference. When we doubt and struggle even to believe, to have faith. I remember during severe depression, when I lived in rural Tampico, we had moved out there from the Chicago area, which is where I grew up. I had never lived in a rural area or small town before. I was accustomed to having things all around me, and so it was a completely different experience living in Tampico. I tried to have faith, and I had the experience of prayers not rising, uh, not rising above that ceiling in that Sorry, but it was an ugly living room. It had the cheapest brown, dark brown paneling that you could imagine. And in the living room, they had closed off one of the windows in order to, to add a closet to the living room. It was just so dark. And I had a new baby, and my husband, he was having so much fun in his first pastorate. And he's, he doesn't know how to draw close. He... He's good at being distant. It's one of his gifts. And so I was really struggling. I was more than two hours from the few friends I had had. It was tough. There were moments of joy. Yeah, when you have a baby, a healthy baby, there are definitely moments of joy. But it was hard. It took years, decades in my life. And I'm finally coming out of that dark place that was much earlier in my life. And I'm learning to grow and change in new ways that are exciting. And I'm making choices for myself that are affirming. Right now, as I move toward more freedom in my life, I fully understand the double meaning of we were like those who dream. I understand coming out of a bad dream. And I understand the uh, awe and wonder that we have in coming into full, full, rich life. So... Yeah, Can, how do you dream of a home when you didn't even really have one? I did in some ways, but I wasn't as at home there as I am now. Uh, in all places, uh, of all places, I'm home here. It's remarkable. So not only is grace good news and worthy of laughter, but there's another key. 
Wisdom teaches us that sorrow carves out the space for deep and abiding joy. Sorrow carves out the place for deep and abiding joy. Another way I think of it is kind of funny. I think of Harry Potter syndrome. You know, Harry was treated horribly by the muggle family that he was put with, fostered in a sense. They didn't want him and they treated him in the worst possible ways. His, um, the bully, the selfish, the son of this muggle family treated him as horribly as the family did. And yet he didn't respond in constricting ways. He responded in expansive ways. Asking questions is part of what nurtures our curiosity. Everything could be one search engine away um, that, that could shut down uh, spending a little time wondering about things. Um, instead of instantly getting an answer through a search engine, what if we think about it? What if we ponder it? What if we guess? What if we spend a little time wondering about things? It might be healthier than immediately getting an answer. All right, well, I saw some humor on curiosity. These were two little things I found. Uh, you know, the little, um, little yellow characters with the goggles? Uh, minions, I guess they're called. One of them said, my curiosity and my common sense are arguing again. This isn't going to end well. <laughs> And I came across a quote by Dorothy Parker. She's a fabulous writer. She died many, many years ago. She was an Oxford scholar in the 1940s when no women were scholars. You know how bright she had to be. She said, the cure for boredom is curiosity. And there is no cure for curiosity. I love that. The cure for boredom is curiosity. There is no cure for curiosity. So Pastor Eric told me a story about his first Good Friday in the church in Rockford. So it was his very first one. And they celebrated by doing a service where they extinguished one candle at a time as they did readings. And it became darker and darker in the sanctuary until finally there was one candle left. And at that point, a door slammed. Uh, in another part of the church, which signified the end, Jesus's death. And it was dramatic and creepy, a little bit of, a little bit of, uh, I, I think it was very dark in that sanctuary with the one candle. And then Pastor Eric went out with the one candle. They sat for a moment in the darkness, and then he came back in and led the people out. Well, there was one more reading after he came back in. And he turned to the altar and there was a body draped on the altar, a grown man's body draped on the altar. He didn't know what to think. He didn't know what to, he was just shocked. And the two men who had played this trick on him uh, were trying to hide their laughter and they did hide it for quite a while. And of course, afterward, they had a great, great laugh about it. They call this metal frame of the body and they only did it the first year it wasn't a yearly thing but they call it slinky jesus <laughs> and eric said slinky jesus is sitting in a closet somewhere because they only used it the first year and he's been there like i don't know 10 years but yeah that would be quite a shock uh, what a great story um yeah another thing is that um when we return to the scriptures the ever-creating God is busy making everything new. So this Isaiah 65 passage is about God creating everything new. When we think, we know what's going on. God creates anew. Uh, how do we respond? I respond with surprise and delight. That's how I feel when I see birds I haven't seen before on a kayak trip or in the woods. Um, butterflies, wildflowers. It doesn't take much to give me complete delight. And the passage goes on to say, pay close attention. Now God says, I'm creating a new heavens and a new earth. All the earlier troubles, chaos, and pain are things of the past. Look ahead with joy. I'll take joy and delight in my people. No more sounds of weeping 
no cries of anguish, no more planting fields that some enemy confiscates, for my people will be as long-lived as trees. My people will have the satisfaction in their work. Wolf and lamb will graze the same meadow. Lion and ox eat straw from the same trough. And this reminds me of a rabbi that one uh, holiday season created um, a storefront and he had a lion and a lamb, a living lion and a lamb. Of course, this is a joke. But he created this and um, the pastors in town asked the rabbi, how did you do that? He said, oh, it's not hard at all as long as you have a steady supply of lambs. <laughs> Again, like I said, it's a joke. Um, yeah, and then we get to the Acts 10, 34, and 35 passage. Peter fairly exploded with his good news. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready, the door is open. Well, my delight in God comes from understanding that there is no playing of favorites. None at all. We are all God's delight. Amen. <laughs>